Welcome back to the garage. Today we're going to be buttoning up a few odds and ends and hopefully get the buggy actually to be able to have a proper idle. Really, that's why we're all here, right? We want to hear those turbo noises. But there are a few other things I want to get buttoned up before I even move on. I was not running a fuel filter. There's a pre-filter that comes with the uh, AEM pump that's in the tank. However, this is my proper fuel filter, which is a 20, I believe it's a 20 micron filter. This pre-filter is like a 100 micron, micron filter. One thing about fuel filters, if you guys are running alcohol or methanol or any of those phenols, make sure that you are using a properly alcohol rated fuel filter. If you're just using the paper fuel filters that are meant for gasoline, uh, E85 will dissolve those filters and it's not gonna work for you. So make sure you're getting one that is specifically designed for the thals. And also, there was a couple other things that you guys reminded me of during the last safety video when I rebuilt the fuel cell, and that was the importance of the foam that goes into the tank. So thanks to you guys, you guys got me covered there. A couple of reasons why it's a very good idea to use the foam. Number one, to help prevent the sloshing from side to side. So I'll get better traction and I won't have a bunch of weight sending the back end of this buggy all crazy directions. And then also, and this is one of the biggest reasons, is this will actually slow the propagation of any combustible fumes. If there was something that got ignited or let's say we put a puncture in the bottom of the tank and it starts dripping fuel, that will, in theory, would prevent that, that flame front from propagating into the tank and then causing an explosion inside the tank, or at least it would slow or help that situation. I haven't been in enough fiery crashes to really tell you how effective this is, but I know that it's a proven solution. These four pieces here, I think I paid about 50 bucks for, so really not too bad, considering that this is also rated for E85. Again, gotta have fuel filters rated for E85, gotta have foam rated for 85 Just go everything rated for 85 Your fuel lines, everything, if you're doing alcohol and methanol. So I got our foam all cut out and fit into the fuel cell and I'm really hoping that this foam does hold up for some while and I'm saying that because I know what E85 does to virtually everything and I want you to see how much this foam has grown just sitting in this fuel tank. The foam is now, oh, I don't know if you guys can see, but it's about half an inch from the top of the tank. So when I put them in, they were they were down to here, and now they've gone up. They've expanded so much, they're practically touching the top. I mean, that's it right there below the fuel neck. But that should definitely keep this thing from sloshing. So it's nice, packed full of foam now. And now I just ordered another fuel sender. The one that I'm getting has a shroud around it. The one I had was all open. And what I was afraid is that with this foam that continued to expand and then it wasn't cut precisely, I was just afraid of everything moving around inside the tank and getting that stopper stuck. Honestly, for a hundred bucks, that's a lot of security for me not having to worry about being way out on a trail and not actually knowing how much fuel I've got left. There's no way to see any fuel level down past unless it's right up at the top. So so I have no way of knowing what's in here in terms of fuel. That's, that's why I went ahead and I ordered myself the shrouded fuel sender. Had a full day yesterday. Let me show you guys the progress I've been making. Now I'm redoing, I had to redo these lines of course because I do need to be running the fuel filter. Uh, I do have the fuel running into it. And by the way guys, I cannot believe how much this foam has actually expanded. It is now touching the top of the tank. 
remember it was only two thirds of the way up there. Oh, so I got my charge pipe on, check this out. But this thing came out nice. My AM dry filter here, the charge side of the turbo, all this piping's hooked up. This is gonna get changed a bit. I was only one coupler short of doing what I wanted to do here. What I need is I just want a 45 degree coming off of the throttle body. And what that would do is it would just drop the height down so this thing would be even on both sides because even though it's all hooked up and it should work fine like that, aesthetically, it's just gonna bug me if it looks all crooked like that. It's just a matter of getting the fueling in now that's appropriate so at least I can get in the idle. But just getting a steady idle so the thing runs, if I had simply um, put a new turbo, a new, sorry for the noise, if the only thing I had done was the new turbo and like the intake manifold and the other stuff, it would actually run really well. Hang on. If the only thing I had done was too much has changed, it, primarily the cam and the injectors. Those things um, heavily. So the last time you guys saw the buggy, it, uh, it wouldn't idle. It would start quickly, like boom, start right up, wouldn't idle. Now when I transferred the tune from the other ECU, what happened is my VDT solenoid was set to a default of active. I don't know how it got to that state. I don't know, it's kind of a mystery at this point, but in any event, if you ever have an idle that just stalls out like that, and you know your fueling is good, and you know your valve clearance is good, and you know your spark is good, and your timing, and you've done all of the other things, always do those other things first. Check your timing, check your spark, check your plugs, check your wiring everything but if you still get to a point where you have compression spark timing fueling valve lash everything is set perfectly the engine starts and dies something worth checking is if you have a vvt engine is that vvt solenoid activating too early the vvt what happens is it closes the intake valve early when you activate vvt and if the engine is not up to about 2000 rpm it will just choke it down now, once you hit about 2,500 RPM, that's when you want your VVT to begin to be active and then have that VVT taper off as you reach red line. Oh, let me bring you guys in here close. Okay, now that I got the new fuel sensor set up, I want you guys to watch the fuel level here. When I shake the buggy, that's the fuel level dancing around in there. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the maximum lag factor into this for the fueling. So, I'm going to put lag factor of 15 and that's maximum smoothing ice cold engine let's see if she starts
Okay, first start, well not really the first start, but the first major start you guys have been a part of. Very successful, you can see it fires right up, it idles better than it ever has before. In fact, there's so far nothing that's not improved on the engine. This is the first oil change. Actually, it does, it looks worse than I thought it would. Let's see the, the crud in there. This is the most important oil change of the entire engine's life. There are some metal flakes in there and that's really why it's important we do this oil change as quickly as we can. Usually somewhere between the first 20 to 30 minutes of runtime, you're gonna wanna swap that oil out for the first time as well as the oil filter. Let's see if I can get you guys right into the, the sparkly stuff. Those little flakes came out of the engine. Some other, actually a lot of crap, wow. All right, I don't know if you guys can see all of the sparklies in there, but man, there's a lot of sparklies. So that was for sure the right time to change that oil immediately. In fact, I kind of wish I had some more conventional oil to waste to do a second run through and change it. Hey guys, welcome back. So last night I got a lot of work done. Well, I guess you'd call it a clutch perch. Got this guy, and you can see this metal's a lot thicker. That's probably, I don't know, quarter inch or something like that. This is what the other material was made out of. It's basically twice as thick as the other material. See, what I did is I brought this one forward. The other design, it was mounted to the back of this bracket, so it was actually welded on back here. So the whole thing was about one inch further that way. Yeah, it's been a rough day. The reason it's all in pieces is because my clutch was not fully releasing. So I had done a couple of things to correct it. I have a brand new, that is a higher throw slave cylinder back there, still wasn't releasing. Then I rebuilt my entire perch for the clutch pedal so that way I can get maximum throw out of that. So at this point I've got over an inch of throw and it's still not releasing. So I know what the problem is just based on the way that it's been reacting to the clutch being depressed. And also your flywheel is going to tell a story. It is critical and I didn't mention this in my clutch video and I'm not sure why I didn't mention this because I know better. But the height, meaning the distance between this section here and the top of the pad there has to be identical. Every one where there's a mounting location there and here and a bolt there, these all have to be even. Mine is not perfectly even, and so what's happening, clutch disc is not evenly and uniformly lifting off that surface. And you can actually see here where the problem area is because down there, there's been pretty much no contact, but up here we can see that those clutch pads were not fully releasing. And so that's why I ran it a bit. I was hoping that it would do just this. I've got it marked, I know what side of the clutch that was on, and I also know that because it's uneven. But the other reason I was making a quick video here is there's oil coming out somewhere and it's on the back side of my flywheel. So I believe that maybe our gasket, I think it might be leaking. So I'm gonna take a peek under there the good news is once I get this all back together and confirm that the clutch is working perfectly, the engine is now working perfectly. All right guys, so this is my new hydraulic press. So this thing's gonna come in handy for just silly little things like popping bearings out of hubs and stuff like that for me. If you have a press handy, you can check to make sure that there's good disengagement on these. So let me show you how that's done. So we've got our pressure plate, flywheel, and the disc. I've got one of these spare release bearings. You don't have to use a bearing, just as long as it's something that's approximately the right size for this. And we're just gonna get that guy centered up. I'm just using um, a socket to go on top to depress that. Put just a tiny bit of pressure on it. Now I should be able to take my alignment tool. So I've got my alignment tool clipped into the drive, the disc. And all I'm gonna do is just come down with this just to make sure that this is releasing enough to take pressure off the disc. And so that's how you can check it. Now you get underneath it and if you can turn that disc freely, you know you're releasing. 
Today is Sunday, so that means Friday evening what I did was I packed up the clutch and the flywheel and I shipped it off to my clutch guy. I did a fairly good job of getting the pressure plate on that clutch to release. However, when I was pulling the clutch disc out, I dropped it. One of the things that I was doing when I was going through that clutch disc is I took my calipers and I measured the spacing at each ceramic puck and they should have been consistent. Well, unfortunately, one of those pucks that came out was quite significantly bowed out. And I have a feeling that it bent the marshal a little bit when I dropped that clutch. So it's entirely possible that I'm just gonna have to have my clutch guy rebuild and start over with a brand new clutch. I'm not really sure he's gonna check out the one that I sent him. If that one can be salvaged, we will use the clutch that I built. And there is one thing that my clutch guy can do that I don't have the ability to do, and that is to balance that clutch basket. I didn't think it was gonna be a problem at first, but having added so much additional weight with the additional spring that's in that basket, really it should be balanced with the rest of the system. So far, just based on my testing, the little bit of run-in that we've done, it does appear that the engine is now better balanced than it was from the factory, if that's even possible. I mean, I guess it's possible, but I figured the factory balance would be as precise as you could possibly get. And the balance side, we had to just add, add, add a bunch more weight into the system to get it to balance. So you would think now having that additional moving mass that the engine would vibrate more. And I don't think it does. I think actually the engine is better balanced now than it was previously. But now that the engine's out, there's a couple of things that we can fix anyway. First of all, I had a small leak. And I don't know if you can see down here, see at the bottom, that's oil. We'll pick that up tomorrow or the next day. So we'll get the seal replaced. And while the engine is apart, you guys know that in my previous videos, I did some testing with the turbo blankets and determined that turbo blankets make a substantial and considerable difference in your school time on your turbos. So I am gonna put uh, another turbo blanket on the system. I wasn't able to do that because of the engine mount. I'll either take this down so I can get the turbo, I, I don't know, but we're gonna do something so I can get this under the turbo with its blanket in place.